One of the common phrases I'll often hear is that a PhD is an original contribution to the body of knowledge. And this is one of those phrases that gets repeated so much that nobody seems to stop and think about what it actually means or whether it's an appropriate phrase to use. So in this video, I'm going to break down some of the common misconceptions around originality and give you a different perspective on what's actually required. But before we get to that, my name's James Hayton. I'm a former physicist, and since 2010, I've coached hundreds of PhD students from a huge range of academic disciplines. And if you want to know more about what I do, check out my website at phd.academy. Now, this idea of an original contribution to knowledge causes a lot of confusion, even among people who give advice to PhD students. And I've heard some say that to conduct original research means you need to look at something that hasn't been looked at before. And this just isn't true. If you look at the academic literature, you might find that there are many research groups working on the same basic problem and publishing work in those areas. These areas are often competitive and fast moving, which creates some difficulty, but being part of an active research area can be a very good thing because there's a ready-made audience for your work when you publish. And because these areas attract funding and create jobs. If you are so original that literally nobody has looked at the problem before, even if you do amazing work, you might find it hard to get others interested and you might find it very hard to get a job in academia or to find funding for research if that's what you want to do after you finish. So there is nuance to this idea of originality. You need to be original in a way that's of interest to others. Sometimes this could mean doing something completely new that has some kind of application or relevance to others. Or it could mean looking at something that a lot of people have already researched, but doing something different. This could be by using a different technique, or it could be by even questioning some of the common but untested assumptions held by others in the field. And it's often this kind of research that has the biggest impact. But if you do something that questions this kind of common assumption, you'd better be prepared to defend it because paradigm shifting work always attracts greater scrutiny. And this brings us to the next key element that's so often completely missed by those who focus on originality, and that is competence. You can be wildly original, but if your research is badly executed, you've got nothing. But if your research is novel in just a few ways and very well executed, you'll be okay. In other words, instead of setting originality as the defining element of a PhD, it is far better to focus on developing skills. As I mentioned in my last video, I define the purpose of a PhD as developing and then demonstrating the skills of a professional academic researcher. And the phrasing here is important. The skill development has to come first because it's your skills that enable you to make a contribution to knowledge. The mistake that is so often made is that people spend far too long reading and writing to find a research gap and to come up with an original proposal, but without developing any of the practical skills they need to actually execute the research. And in some cases, people can spend years refining the idea and leaving themselves just months to conduct the work, but without the skills or experience to do it well. Although I do recognize that sometimes it's the supervisors who hold students back until they've got a perfect proposal while also giving no guidance. So I'm not saying this is your fault. However, if you get practical experience developing research skills early, not by reading, but by doing, you'll be much more likely to come up with a good proposal because first, you'll understand what's practically possible. And second, you'll find interesting things to work on by actually working. 
you'll also have a much better understanding of what's already been done because you'll have some practical experience to relate to. In my own PhD, I reached a point where I could very quickly assess the quality of a paper reporting scanning probe microscope experiments because I had done literally thousands of experiments using that kind of equipment. And one of my papers came about not by starting with an original idea, but by investigating an unexpected result. And that accidental discovery only became an original paper because I had the skill and the experience to recognize the result and then investigate it properly. Skills are the foundation you need to be able to develop and execute your ideas, but they're also your safety net. So let's say you come up with a brilliantly original idea, but then someone else publishes what you plan to do. This is never good, but if you've developed a solid set of skills during your PhD, then you are far more likely to be able to adapt quickly. So let's go back to my definition of a PhD in terms of developing and then demonstrating the skills of a professional academic researcher. And let's focus on the demonstration part. Professional academics try to produce work of a publishable standard. And in some countries, to obtain a PhD, you have to have a certain number of publications in peer-reviewed journals. And while that isn't the case everywhere, it provides a pretty good approximation for what the examiners are looking for. So instead of asking what makes an original contribution, we should be asking what makes research publishable? Now this will of course vary across different fields and different journals, but there are some general principles. Originality is important. You do need some new insight or discovery to report, but an original insight or discovery isn't enough. The reviewer will also probably be asking, first, is it clear what the research is trying to do and why it matters? Second, have appropriate methods been used to achieve the research goals? And this is not just the general choice of method, but the details of the execution. Third, has sufficient high quality evidence or data been gathered? Fourth, has the analysis been competently executed and clearly explained? And fifth, are your conclusions actually consistent with the data and the analysis? Now this isn't a complete list. There are other things like using appropriate citations and so on. But if any of these five things are missing, the paper will probably be rejected or sent back for major re revisions, regardless of the originality. Now some of these points relate to the clarity and structure of the writing, but the most important points come back to the quality of execution of the research. It comes back to developing skills. So I'll talk more about how to develop your research skills in an upcoming video. And if you'd like to know when that video comes out, then head to my website at phd.academy and sign up for email notifications so I can let you know when I publish new videos. So that's all for me. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.